seems that they're not concerned really about mixing in pagan elements into Catholic worship. As we know, when the Pope visited Canada, what was that, in 2022, I believe, he and high-ranking cardinals participated in essentially inviting us into the circle of spirits, which is demonic, obviously. We'll welcome back Matt Gaspers, now managing editor of Inside the Vatican, to discuss news of a trial period for a so-called Amazonian rite of the Mass. By the way, my name is Joe McLean. I host a radio program called A Catholic Take, where we look at the world through a Catholic lens. I'd love for you to hang out with us. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. We're joined now by Matt Gaspers, formerly of Catholic Family News, now the managing editor of Inside the Vatican. So uh, there is a, a trial period, I, I understand, of a so-called Amazonian rite of the Catholic Mass. Uh, tell us a little bit about this and what what is this uh, trial period? What does it mean to have a trial period? Yeah, so uh, the uh, senior Vatican correspondent at LifeSite News published a report yesterday, Michael Hines. I think he might he's probably been on this show before. So the headline says, New Amazon Rite of the Mass to Enter Three-Year Experimental Phase. The Amazon Rite, inspired by local traditions and customs in the region and proposed at the 2019 Amazon Synod, will enter a three-year experimental phase in late 2024, a Vatican theologian has said. So essentially, it's kind of like a, a pilot program for this proposed Amazonian Rite, which is something that was brought up in throughout the Amazon Synod in 2019, but it was specifically mentioned in the uh, the working or not the the uh, the final document for that synod, which called for quote the elaboration of an Amazonian rite that expresses the liturgical, theological, disciplinary, and spiritual patrimony of the Amazon. Uh -huh. And obviously, in light of what we saw during that synod with the whole Pachamama debacle, that's very concerning because it seems that they're not. Um, concerned really about mixing in pagan elements into Catholic worship, which is obviously a problem. It talks about the elaboration of a rite that expresses the liturgical, theological, disciplinary, and spiritual patrimony of the Amazon, meaning the Amazon region. And it doesn't qualify any of those things as, you know, within the Catholic context or according to Christian tradition. It simply says the liturgical, theological, disciplinary, and spiritual patrimony of the Amazon. And that obviously is a pagan patrimony if it's not um, set within the Christian context. So this kind of thing seems to be getting more and more uh, common and tolerated by the Vatican. As we know, when the Pope visited Canada, what was that, in 2022, I believe, mm -hmm. I mean, he, he and high-ranking cardinals participated in essentially in that, uh, I guess it wasn't smudging, but it was the, the guy who was blowing on the whistle or something and calling on the the western grandmother or something some uh -huh, nonsense the grandmother like that. of the west yeah mm -hmm. yeah the, yeah and inviting us into the circle of spirits which is demonic obviously yep and this kind of thing seems to be getting more common like earlier this year for the uh chrism mass i think it was somewhere in wisconsin i remember seeing a video footage of this that the and this was in the presence of the local bishop for the chrism mass obviously they did something similar in the cathedral church and this was in superior wisconsin where they did a, a native american you know four direction thing which again is is pagan symbolism so it's very concerning that they're going to allow this uh, amazonian right to move forward i know i've also heard about this uh, a mayan right that apparently the mexican bishops have gotten behind which is probably very similar to what this Amazonian rite is going to look like. And it seems like these, the bishops and including Pope Francis, they seem to be forgetting that for centuries when the church would go out and do missionary work and convert pagan nations to the faith, yeah. uh, our forefathers in the faith didn't seem to think that we needed to create a new rite out of whole cloth for them, incorporating their local traditions and theology and customs or whatever. It was assumed that those people were capable of embracing the gospel as it was preached by the missionaries and assimilating to the Roman rite. They didn't need their own special rite in order to become Catholic. I, I'm reminded of the uh, 
the story of the conversion of the Flathead Indians by Father DeSmet when uh, he went out into the Dakotas and preached to the Flathead Indians. Now, there was a, uh, uh, a spiritual uh, precursor to this when um, I think it was Shining Shirt had a mystical experience where he was told, wait for the men in black robes and they mm -hmm. will teach you the big prayer. And Father DeSmet, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating because there were a lot of uh, Protestant groups that, that went out there first to try and convert the Flathead Indians. And they said, ah, you're not in black robes. Oh, and by the way, you're also against the big prayer, which is the mass. So, mm. yeah, we don't want to have anything to do with you. So they waited for the black robes to show up. And finally, Father DeSmet went out there. And not only did they welcome him, but they wept when he went away the first time. Was he participating in any smudging ceremonies? Was he getting involved in ceremonial dances and having them incorporate the ceremonial dances in the mass? Absolutely not. No, he was there preaching the word, con telling them exactly what the church teaches, and then he taught them the big prayer. He taught them the mass. And they loved mm -hmm. him for it, and they loved the mass, and they all converted. It's, so this idea that you have to uh, start incorporating cultural practices into liturgical practices is completely false. Yeah, and I mean, before the Second Vatican Council, um, just in the decades leading up to it, there were several very good encyclicals written on missionary work by Benedict the Fifteenth and Pius the Eleventh. Pius the Twelfth wrote in 1951. Um, that Catholic missionaries do not need to, quote, transplant European civilization and culture and no other to foreign soil there to take root and propagate itself. But he did say uh, missionaries must work to form the souls of native peoples. So, quote, they are ready to accept willingly and in a practical manner the principles of Christian life and morality, Principles, he said, that fit into any culture, provided it be good and sound, and which give that culture greater force in safeguarding human dignity and in gaining human happiness. So it's not like the, the native peoples around the world that the church seeks to convert need to become European, but they do need to become Catholic. They do, and they need to set it. So whatever is good on a natural level can subsist and remain in their cultural practices but anything that's associated with superstition and paganism or false religion obviously has to be purged and needs to be replaced by the true faith, which uh, in our day doesn't seem to be a priority to the so-called missionaries. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, in in the uh, Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sancro Sanctum Concilium, that's really where we see the the seeds of these you know, experimentation and all kinds of, especially in missionary lands. Here's what the document says. Provisions shall also be made when revising the liturgical books for legitimate variations and adaptations to different groups, regions, and peoples, especially in mission lands, provided that the substantial unity of the Roman rite is preserved. And this should be borne in mind when drawing up the rites and devising rubrics. It goes on to say, in some places and circumstances, however, an even more radical adaptation of the liturgy is needed, so they claim, and this entails greater difficulties. And my response to that is, one wonders how the substantial unity of the Roman rite, as they say, can possibly be preserved when radical adaptation of the liturgy is something presented as legitimate and necessary. And ultimately, the Novus Ordo, as you're alluding to all itself has already decimated the liturgical unity that existed for centuries in the Roman church. So it's, it's very sad that they're continuing this uh, liturgical revolution, I think would be the correct term. You know, the most charitable interpretation, I guess, is that these people who are in charge of this are very misguided and simply think that the natives need their own special right in order to embrace the faith and practice the faith, which is simply not the case. And then obviously there's always the prospect that we're dealing with infiltrators who are deliberately trying to undermine the faith, which is not outside the realm of possibility, as we know. You know, one other thing that comes to mind with the incorporation of or trying to come up with these Amazonian right or Mayan right. And my understanding is that in the, the local cultures, the women play a significant leadership role in these religious rites. So that could be another part of it. You know, there's still this push in the church 
uh, for the ordination of women, if not to the priesthood, then at least to the diaconate. We're still seeing this talked about in the Synod on Synodality, the second session of which begins next month around this, about a month from now in Rome. And Cardinal Hollerich, who is the Relator General for the Synod, is still talking about, you know, if women don't just recently, or I guess back in July, he gave an interview to America Magazine and was saying stuff like, if women don't feel welcome in the church, then we failed. And if they still really want to be ordained deacons, then we really need to take that into consideration, blah, blah, blah. So maybe that's the angle they're going for. I don't know. No, Matt, you're married. I'm married. We both have lovely wives. Uh, do uh, Does your wife feel left out or unwelcomed in the Catholic Church because she's not allowed to become a deacon? Certainly not. Certainly yeah. not. She would never want that. <laughs> <laughs> Mine either. So I think you're absolutely hitting it on the head when you say that what's happening here is that this is a stealth maneuver to start introducing some of those uh, other ideologies that they just can't get passed through the Western or the Westernized part of the Catholic Church. The, the part that says, you know, we've never had a tradition or a custom for women to be ordained in any way, shape or form. So then if they can say, well, but uh, in some of these other cultures where we're having these new cultural rights being introduced, uh, where it was a part of their traditions and customs on the local level to mm -hmm. have women involved in liturgical practices, well, it seems to me that, uh, you know, that would make sense then. We're, we're going to introduce women in those cultural roles to the liturgical roles because, well, it's part of the custom and, and now it's traditional, right? Yeah, and so all those women who want to be ordained deacons, I guess they can petition the Holy See to transfer to the Amazonian right and get out of the Roman <laughs> right. right. <laughs> Did you like that video? It's okay. You can admit it. It's perfectly fine. Hey, we cover the big stories of our day, from inside the church to outside the church to all points in between, and we do it from a Catholic perspective. It's called a Catholic Take. It's a radio program Monday through Friday. We live stream it right here on this channel, by the way, so make sure to subscribe, like, and share. We would be very grateful to you. And don't forget, you're going to want to watch this video right here because you don't want to miss anything.